My name is Julien Garnon. I work as an interventional radiologist at the University Hospital of Strasbourg in France. I started Osteocool in 2015. At that time, we had different ablation devices, cryo, microwave, monopolar radiofrequency ablation, but none of these devices were designed for bone. And so we were very much interested at started Osteocool procedure, which was supposed to be pretty much reliable and predictable. And this is especially uh, interesting when you are going to spine, for example, which is a challenging location for ablation. A good candidate for an osteocool procedure is a patient that presents with a painful metastasis and a focal pain. And uh, in that setting, osteocool uh, is a nice option to achieve pain palliation by providing local ablation and bone consolidation with thermantoplasty. In my institution, every patient, every case is discussed with a surgeon, a radiation therapist, an oncologist, and an interventional radiologist. This is where we choose the best local treatment depending on what the patient already had and what we are expecting. The advantage of osteocool is that you can perform it before radiation, but you can also perform it after radiation if it fails. So it's quite interesting because you can treat the patient at different uh, times of his disease uh, without any kind of issue. Most of the patient after the procedure of radiofrequency ablation and somatoplasty will decrease uh, their consummation in opioids after a few days. My suggestion to physicians that want to start an osteocool procedure is first of all to properly select the patient. Choose a lesion that is not too big, where you can ablate easily and where you can cement just after the procedure in order to have good results for the first treatments. Another important point for physicians is to be trained to the specificity of spine and MSK procedures. To learn about the proximity of the spinal cord, the nerves, and to be able to protect them whenever necessary. The technique of osteocool is quite easy to perform, but you have to do it the right way. So mapping of the ablation zone before starting uh, to proceed to ablation is critical. And uh, to achieve that, you need to properly position the introducer, the drills, the RFA props, if needed, the thermal sensor. And so it's critical to do it at the right way to have the best result as possible. The approach to extraspinal lesions is a little bit different. In most of cases, you will need a parallel approach between the two introducers. Also, the proximity of nerves is a little bit different, so it's not just the spinal cord behind, but you have to think about all the nerves around, such as the sciatic nerve or femoral nerve in an iliac ablation, for example. The great interest of osteopool, to my point of view, is its great predictability and reliability because it's a bipolar system. That means you can control the target temperature very precisely, you can control the ramp rate at which the temperature is rising very precisely, and gives, this gives you extra confidence when you are ablating. The patient that you are going to see in the video is a 72 years old woman that has a primary neuroendocrine lung cancer, and she's now presenting with a single painful mat located at the posterior part of the acetabulum. There was no previous treatment for that metastasis, including no radiation therapy and no thermal ablation. Pain score is at 5 over 10. After discussion at the tumor board, it was decided to offer to the patient combined radiofrequency ablation and cementoplasty. Stereotactic radiation therapy was kept as a secondary option in case of failure of thermal ablation. The procedure will be performed with the osteocool device under general anesthesia with combined CT fluoroscopic guidance. The first step of the procedure is to check whether or not the sciatic nerve, which is located just behind the tumor, can be effectively protected using hydrodissection. To do so, a 22-gauge spinal needle is inserted just behind the posterior part of the cortex of the acetabulum. As you can see here, the needle is carefully advanced with intermittent CT controls. The needle's tip has to be advanced just posterior to the acetabulum. Once it has reached the area of the sciatic nerve, which is represented by the yellow circle, hydrodissection can be performed. To check for the proper distribution of dissection, I will use a mixture of 5% contrast in dextrosis. The syringe is connected to the spinal needle, and then the spinal needle is carefully advanced while maintaining injection on the syringe. That helps to dissect the nerve away from the posterior cortex of the acetabulum. You can see how nicely the sciatic nerve has been pushed away on the CT control. Also note, how contrast helps to identify the nerve and assess proper distribution of dissection. Now that the nerve is effectively protected, 
we can proceed to the insertion of the bone trocar. In order to achieve complete ablation with safety margins, I will be ablating using a simultaneous dual probe approach. The skin is opened in order to introduce the first bone trocar, which is a 10 gauge introducer in that case. I will use a lateral approach to the metastasis. The goal is to put the first introducer at the superior part of the lesion. The tip of the introducer is carefully manually fixed inside the cortex of the bone. Once stable, it can be further advanced using a hammer. The second bone trocar is inserted exactly the same way, parallel and inferior to the first one. A short 3D acquisition is performed in order to assess the proper location of both introducers. As you can see on these MPR reconstructions, they are located as planned at the superior and inferior part of the metastasis. Before proceeding to probes insertion, protection of the joint has to be considered, A thermal injury in that location can lead to devastating secondary joint destruction. To do so, a 13-gauge bone trocar is inserted in between the two osteocol introducers. The goal is to target the posterior part of the coxofemoral joint in order to measure the temperature in that location. Once the tip is located inside the bone, the inner cannula is removed and a 20 gauge needle that comes in an additional thermosensor osteocol compatible set is coaxially advanced inside the medullar bone. This will allow us to position a thermosensor just posterior to the cartilage of the acetabulum without transfixing the joint. The thermosensor will therefore be correctly located in between the cartilage and the anterior part of the metastasis. Now that all needles are in position, it's time to introduce the radiofrequency ablation probes. First, the stilet of the introducers are removed. The osteocool drill is used to create a pathway within the cancellous bone and to choose the proper active tip length. Drilling is first performed on the introducer located superiorly and then on the one located inferiorly. In that case, two 20mm active tip probes can be inserted. A dedicated osteocool compatible 28 gauge thermosensor is inserted inside a 20 gauge needle. The two 20mm active tip radiofrequency ablation probes are connected to the osteocool generator. The drills are removed and the radiofrequency ablation probes are inserted through the introducer. As they are all osteocool compatible devices, there is no risk of interaction between the active tip of the RFA probe and the introducer. Before starting ablation, a 3D acquisition is performed in order to check for the proper position of all devices. Multiplanar reconstructions show that the metastasis is located in between the two radiofrequency ablation probes. Hence, the ablation should cover the lesion with safety margins. The thermosensor is correctly located just posterior to the cartilage. Finally, an additional thermosensor was positioned posterior to the acetabulum. This will give us two securities regarding the sciatic nerve. Hydrodissection that pushed away the nerve and temperature measurement. Radiofrequency ablation can now be started. The target temperature was set to 70 degrees on both probes. As you can see, the system displays the temperature given by the two optional thermosensors. The temperature at the tip of the probes is slowly growing with a ramp rate of 10 degrees per minute. The target temperature is 70 degrees at the tip of the probes. During the whole time, I have a careful look at both thermosensors. Because of the nearness of the RFA probes, the cartilage is more exposed. What you can also see is that the intact cortex of the posterior acetabulum is insulating the sciatic nerve from the ablation zone. Cortex insulation is a typical feature of bipolar radiofrequency ablation. When the temperature is reaching 60 degrees close to the cartilage, I have to stop ablation to avoid any thermal injury to the joint. 
We did not complete the scheduled 15 minutes ablation cycle. I will therefore wait a little bit for the temperature near the cartilage to decrease and then start a second cycle. In the same way as before, ablation will be stopped once the temperature near the cartilage is reaching 60 degrees. Once ablation has been completed, we have to perform cementoplasty to ensure bone consolidation. The two bone introducers I slightly advanced over the RFA probes and then the RFA probes are retrieved. I'm waiting a little bit and then I'm introducing the thermal sensor within the ablated area. I have to check the temperature because if the cementoplasty occurs too early, cement might set too fast because of the high local temperature. After 5 minutes, temperature has decreased to 40 degrees. Cement can now be prepared and injected. I will use a standard PMMA bone cement. It will be injected with help of the dedicated cannula that goes through the bone introducer. Cement is carefully and slowly injected under continuous fluoroscopic monitoring. Intermittent CT acquisition is also performed to check for the proper distribution of cement in the anteroposterior axis. Once the ablated area is completely filled with cement, all the devices are removed. A final CT acquisition with MPL reconstructions shows proper distribution of cement in the ablated area. During the first 24 hours after the procedure, the patient has experienced minimal pain. There was no need for additional analgesic. The pain score has decreased to 1 over 10 after one week, and the one month follow-up MRI is consistent with a complete ablation of the lesion. The one-year restaging PET CT did not demonstrate any local tumor progression, and there was no sign of thermal injury to the joint.